Hi, this is John Davidson from the Hollywood Squares, and that's incredible, and Disney movies, and where else? Uh, and I, I love listening to the Claws Corner. It's one of the best blogs around. The guy's very clever, and uh, I'm proud to be uh, supporting the Claws Corner. Welcome to the latest episode of The Claws Corner. Today's guest is a singer, songwriter, actor, producer, and entrepreneur. After taking a break from music for personal reasons at age 20, he eventually began buying and selling properties. He used that money to start the first of several companies that he owns. Not ready to settle down to a normal life, he began writing song lyrics and acting in movies. His acting credits include The Halloween 2018, which is a direct sequel to the original, Trading Paint starring John Travolta, Shania Twain, and Michael Madsen, Eye for an Eye, Scared to Death starring Lynn Shea, Bill Mosley, and Ray Don Chong, and Hellbilly Howl, which he produced, starred, and wrote music for. This will be the first film launching his Hellbilly Howl franchise. He released his debut EP, Work Hard, Rock Hard, in 2021, working and touring with some of the best in the business. His mission is to work hard, play hard, and spread positivity. Sounds like a great way to live life to me. So with that being said, please welcome the Renaissance man himself, Mr. Kurt Dimer to the Claws Corner. Kurt, how the hell are you? Good. How are you, brother? Richard, I couldn't have said that any better, man. It's like, it's life. We have one, one life. Let's live life. Let's make the most of life. Any adversity in our life, let's just keep uh, plodding ahead and uh, using that creative part of your brain. If you know you have that creative part you want to tap into and never say never, man. That's That's just how I do it. And that's what I do. And what is a normal life? It, that's all the be, in the mind of the beholder of what normal is. So Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, doing my research on you, I love this quote. It said, uh, I'm here to encourage others to treat people with respect, dignity, and kindness. I've been through a lot of things in my life, and I try to share that with others and be a beacon of hope for my listeners. So that is, as you said before, it's a great message. I love the fact that you not only say it, but you live that, and you're an inspiration to many. And I agree with you. I said, what is normal? I mean, I love the things you're doing. I love the fact you're great, making great music, touring with great bands, you're making movies. And I have to say, I just the other night, because I was doing my research, and I never even heard of this movie, Trading Paint with John Travolta, Michael Madsen, and Shania Twain. That was such a great movie. I love that movie. I was like, how did I not hear of this before? Yeah, that, that's kind of what's got me back. I, I, once I suppressed everything in 2020, or when I was 20, not 2020, I got, I went down, My I had started some oil companies. Uh, yeah, Spitfire, back right? In, Starfire. Starfire, sorry. Starfire. Yeah, back in, back in my early 30s. And uh, I was uh, getting placements of my oil brand in films, and I went down there to do a cameo as part of a placement thing. And they uh, all of a sudden offered me a speaking role. And about two, three hours later, I'm acting with planning out a scene with John Travolta. I'm like, what the hell just happened to me? And uh, met Shania Twain. I'm standing there. We're doing this big scene at the end of the movie. And two months later, I get in Halloween 2018, get killed by Michael Myers and the John Carpenter, or, you know, official like sequel to the original. Mm -hmm. And uh, on, while I'm sitting there shooting that in the gas station, just sitting there, you know, with Michael Myers, James, Jude, Courtney, and I've got my thing all over my face that makes me look murdered like crazy. And I'm just like, I can do my own horror franchise as well like this. And then I can lead and show people what I can really do and how my brain really is. And that's how it all started, man. Yeah. <laughs> After that, music just kind of came back as well. So after you took the break from music, so you, acting was what came first then? Because I know you said you started, according to what I was reading, you started writing the lyrics, but then, you, like you said, you were working for, that, for your company, and then you got the cameo in um, Trading Paint. So acting came first, and then you started putting, uh, well, I know. Well, yeah, once I got those two roles, then I started doing some smaller projects like Eye for an Eye and some other stuff down in Alabama. And I met a gentleman by the name of Ben Trexel who had, three songs that uh, he had done for a friend of mine who was on the acting side and they hooked me and him up and I said yeah I, I dig those tunes I go I used to sing I, I sing a lot different than everybody else because I don't try to be somebody I'm not 
and I love doing it. And maybe I should do that too. And uh, we recorded those three. I got his vocals off because they were very generic. And then we just started writing songs together and uh, put a demo together under the, the um, name Bald Man, which I went under for a while. And then uh, took that out to L.A. once we got it mixed the way we wanted it. And uh, during COVID in March of 2020, my manager, I got a little studio out there. I figure I'm going to take my talents to L.A. and see if I can turn them into anything. And that when COVID hit, uh, we had reached out to some bigger uh, mixers from the L.A. area. And Chris Lord Algae said that he would gladly take a look at it and mix it. He liked my unique voice and all that. And we had this uh, demo of Have a Cigar by Pink Floyd that Ben wanted me to do. And I wasn't really feeling the vibe on it or anything. And Chris said, well, let me show you what we can do with this. Next thing I know, he's got Phil X playing guitar on it. Two months later, I'm shooting a music video for Have a Cigar, which you can see on YouTube. And mm -hmm. Phil X and I started writing, and we started tweaking what Ben and I had written. And to this day, I can't stop writing. And uh, we've got probably up to 40 songs in a pipeline that we can't even decide which ones we want to put out. So it's it's all happened so fast. It's crazy, man. Well, that's what I want to talk about. I mean, you just covered a lot in 30 seconds. So I want to go through that with a fine tooth comb because there is a lot that yeah. you just went over. So first I want to start, I want to talk about the movies first because as you said, you started with trading paint. I want to um, ask you a question because my brother used to be a fighter pilot in the Navy and years ago he flew over the California Angels Anaheim Stadium because they were in the World Series. So he was doing a flyover and then he got invited to a couple of parties. He said he met John Travolta, Jim Belushi, and George Lopez. He said, Out of all the people he ever met, John Travolta was the most down earth, nicest, most generous person he ever met. He said, and so he, in the middle of it, he goes, I don't want to hear about you. I want, he goes, I don't want, don't worry about me. I want to know more about you. He said he was so nice. Um, did you have that same experience? with john yeah john was uh very uh, gracious um i mean i don't know if he knew i they just kind of picked me off the lot i don't know if he knew i was there for starfire but regardless of where i came from and we had a scene to shoot it was 2 30 in the morning it was the final scene of the movie they needed to wrap that night yeah. you know because there's costs involved if you got to bring everybody back the next day and he just looked at me as one of the fellow actors and we talked through the scene how he wanted me to to, to do it and then toby sebastian from game of thrones who i did the scene with he was very gracious uh, we got cool pictures together and he walked had told me you know walk me through it and i had never been in front of a camera i wasn't a thespian i'd never have taken an acting lesson in my life and the way it just all happened so naturally, I looked at it, that was a sign, and I just took it from there, and here we are talking today. So, And, of course, Michael Madsen, I'm a big fan of, from mostly from the Quentin Tarantino movies, like, obviously, with Reservoir Dogs and other movies. Oh, yeah. He's such, he's such a great character actor, too. And Shania, I mean, I, that was, I was actually impressed with how great of an actor she was in that movie. I... I don't think I ever saw her act before. I mean, I'm sure she's been in other movies, but I don't really know. But with that one, she, she played perfectly off of Travolta and the rest of the cast. Like, yeah, that, no, I, mean, I don't, I don't know if she has been in any other ones. Okay, my, so, I, that might have been her first one. Yeah, but some I want to talk about more of the the rest of the movies, like Halloween in 2018. How did that come about? So you was trading paint first because that was what you were doing. Trading paint was first. Uh, yeah, I shot that in uh, September of 17. Yeah. It came out actually after Halloween did, I think, later. The post was a little longer on that. Yeah. Halloween I shot in January of 18. Yeah. The begin and, and that was down in South Carolina, and that ended up coming out in October of 18. Yeah. And uh, But they that, that was on the fast track. You know, that had Blumhouse behind it and – they wanted to get it out for Halloween that year. So that was just surreal. And then that's where I catapulted from that, where I decided to do my own franchise, Hellbilly Hollow. And I shot that in 19. And that, because it was my first project, I had a bunch of people around me that really didn't know how to bring it to the finish line. So I've been doing that for the past couple of years. And now it's just this fine feature film that's going to really kick off the whole franchise of hellbilly hollow so that's the, the order in which all that happened so before we get to that was john carpenter was a producer of halloween 2018 is that correct was he part of that movie 
he was the producer. His family was part of that movie because he was the original. Yeah. But David Gordon Green was the director of that movie. Okay. So was John on the set? I never, not on the day I was on the set. So, so I was on, I was on an isolated set that, that our, our whole shoot was one day at a gas station in South Carolina. Now growing up, were you a big horror movie fan? I saw Halloween. I saw Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. My favorite movie is The Devil's Rejects oh, by Rob. Oh, yeah. 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 The, it's funny you said I love that because, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, sorry. Uh, it's funny you said that because when people talk about Rob Zombie, I always bring that one up first. It's a Devil's Reject out of all of his movies. That's definitely my favorite. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It, it, that captivated me. And it actually, when I did my oh. character for Hellbilly Hollow, I modeled a lot of my craziness after Bill Mosley and the Devil's Rejects. And then here I am, you know, in March of this year, shooting that movie with Bill Mosley and now him and I are friends. And he was kind of my role model for how I wanted to portray my character Bull in Hellbilly Hollow. <laughs> yeah. I met him several times at the Chiller Convention. He is one of the nicest people I ever met. He's so down to earth, so friendly, so open and willing to talk about anything. And so, so I can imagine working with him must have oh, been he's a so blast. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, know, you can imagine when it's like sitting there to shoot a scene over and over and over and in the breaks, we're just sitting there and he's just making everybody laugh. And yeah. He told my director, which I thought was quite a uh, compliment and something I'll never forget, that, uh, or he texted him and he said, Kurt, Kurt, if I play a character called the Grog and scared to death, I'm a horror icon. And he said, Kurt's one of the best straight men I've ever worked with in my life. And that's pretty huge. So Bill and I will be doing more together. That is very, very cool to hear. I think the end of Devil's Rejects has the best use of a song, period. I love yep. the Skinner Freebird going down the road shooting. It's just, so I, you know, I love when we're going to talk about your music in movies too, but I just love when you get a song and it just goes perfectly with the movie. And that, that Rob Zombie scene in Devil's Reject was the, one of my all time favorites. But to, oh, yeah. But speaking of that, that's what inspired me for my single Doom that's out that I wrote that for Hellbilly Hollow. I modeled the ending scene of Hellbilly Hollow when you see the movie. It's an epic exit and it's that Doom kicks right in as it does. And it's kind of that slow mo feel like you know, you get from the devil's rejects and we're not in a car, but You'll see it. It's you'll you'll go. Okay, now I know where Kirk got that from. Now, when's that movie going to be released? Um, right, we're sh it's out being shopped right now. It's out the American film market right now. Actually, we're going to see how that goes. If not, I've got other people in line to look at it that are ready to go. Um, but I'm in really no rush because the movie um, "Scared to Death" I shot in March is ready to go now, and we've got a lot of a lot of big companies interested in it and that stars lynn shea from insidious and all her films and bill mosley and me alongside them as a lead character so it can't hurt hellbilly hollow if scared to death comes out in theaters first and then people go okay here's another kurt dimer movie right on the heels of that where they might not have known who i was before scared to death with lynn and bill so i know that's, that's, that's a, kind that's a, yeah it's a win-win situation for you yeah so I, i'm in no rush so yep. I have we're to just wait, waiting for the right deal. Well, I have to say, I think, uh, have you ever seen the Bill Mosley movie, Repo, the genetic opera? It's no. Got, it's got okay. him, Paul Sorvino. Believe it or not, she's actually good in this, and I would never even think that she would be, but Paris Hilton's in it. It's a great movie. It's an, it's an opera. Bill Mosley singing, Paul Sorvino singing. It's, it's done very, very well, but it's, it's a horror movie. Horror opera, I guess. Really? Yeah. No, I'm not. I'll have to check that out, man. Yeah. I, I do have to say, I, I watch your videos. I watch the one I talk about. So I love songs that have a story. And I was watching your videos, and Doom was great. That line I love. It's like, what is it? Uh, I have it written down. It's like, uh, oh, yeah, I've got some flowers for your mother. You got the gun. Yeah. Walker. I love that video. I watched that probably about four or five times. Such a catchy tune. Oh. And the video well, is done you. very well, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, we shot that up with my manager's Brian Wheat. Um, from Tesla, the bass player from any manages Tesla. And uh, we shot that up in his uh, town of Auburn, New York. And they have all these old houses from back in the colonial days where a lot of people who ran the country had their mansions. 
and uh we were in one of those houses that was actually haunted and just uh it was crazy it was fun and we shot that in like a day yeah well before we even get to the music i want to talk about hellbilly howl because there is a real hellbilly howl in alabama and was that what the yes. movie was based on yeah kevin wayne he's another actor him and i became friends we did a couple things when i was doing a podcast back in the day from a few songs that i just did on the fly and we met and uh, when I did after I did Halloween, I called Kevin. I go, I want to shoot, you know, shoot a horror movie. I really didn't know many people, anybody in California at the time, and they were doing some stuff in Alabama. And he said, let's do that Hellbilly Hollow movie I've told you about. So then we came up with all these unique kills and how crazy we were going to be. And he plays my brother Tickles, who can't even talk. He can only communicate with me, and I'm his brother Bull, and I'm just a crazy ass motherfucker and uh <laughs> we just created the film from there and we kevin and i lived in trailers on the on the site of this haunted attraction hellbilly hollow so the sets were already there because it's a real attraction and uh, it kind of introduces you like halloween did in 78 79 to jamie lee curtis and that franchise and we already have written hellbilly hollow Two, the hollow gang and it'll take you back to our roots and how we even ended up where we were at hellbilly hollow so so how many films do you have written for that franchise so far hellbilly hollow Two's written um we've got scared to death and hellbilly hollow in the can those will be coming out and then my uh director of scared to death and i who also write wrote the hellbilly hollow script along with me we're writing a script right now for a Western, Dumb and Dumber Western called Two Donkeys that Bill uh, Mosley and I will, uh, right now it's him and I as the the guys that ride the two donkeys, but we're cowboys that are afraid to ride, ride horses, kind of like people are afraid to fly, so we <laughs> take donkeys. But we're badass mercenaries who help people. <laughs> That's funny. I cannot wait to sit. Now, you wrote this? We're writing it right now. Yeah. Oh, so you and Bill are too. So you're hanging out with some pretty cool people. I like that. It's like you and Bill. Yeah. Are be the well, new Bill, I don't know how, how much Bill will be involved in it, but it's uh, Paul Boyd and I. Paul Boyd's the director of Scared to Death and yeah. my writing partner. And uh, we've got several scripts that we're working on. We're also working on a film we're going to do over in Scotland where I, I'm the leader of a coven of witches. And it's a movie called Lord of the Witches, which is about a true story. So. I can't really say much more about that in Two Donkeys, but we're working on those too. So. Well, I guess that just means you're going to have to come back on the Claws Corner when that gets released. Yeah. We'll talk about it then. <laughs> Whenever, man. Whenever. I love it. So are you starting, I'm guessing you're writing the franchise, and did you start your own production company as well for movies? Yeah, yeah, I own Bald Man Films, and uh, you'll see that moniker, you know, before any of my films. So I own my own production company um, as well as ACT, and then I – you know, Kurt, of course, my band goes under my name, Kurt Dimer. So you can kind of tie the acting and the movies together. And my character from Scared to Death is going to be doing a lot of crazy stuff. So just remember the name, the Grog. That must be, I think I would have more fun playing the crazy psycho killer than I would the straight hero, like who just, you know, is the more dramatic role. I'd have more fun just being crazy, insane, out of control. So I would love to be doing what you're doing. Just and you know, so, Yeah, and Hellbilly Hollow let me do that. I, got, yeah. I could create this character. My voice was crazy. And then, and scared to death, I'm a horror icon who's been in films for over 30, 40 years. That's well known, but the you know, we're create the, the creation of this character, the Grog, Gregory Grogstone, but it's really me and I'm the Grog. So then it's a totally different take on what I can do. You know, I could be me, but then I'm this character. So it's where really did you come crazy. Up with that character? Where, where did you come up now with the character? Where did you Paul come up with the uh, synopsis of the, like the, the origin the, of the story? The, the writer, Paul Boyd, who uh, wrote Hellbilly Hollow 2, he had this script that he wrote it about eight, nine years ago. And then once he realized, I want you to play the grog, he rewrote uh, a lot of the script along with Lynn Shea, her input and all that. And we brought it to life. And that's what you're going to be seeing in theaters next year. I cannot wait. So it's going to have a wide release then? Yeah. All right. I'll be I'll be shocked if it doesn't. Yeah. with Lynn and Bill in it oh, and exactly. the quality of the movie and how crazy it is. It, it, I'll be shocked. It should come out everywhere. Yeah. 
Well, I definitely will be the first one to, in line waiting and buying it. Yeah. I cannot wait for that one. I just love the fact that you're doing all this stuff. When people say, oh, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. You're a touring musician. You're playing all over the place. You're a full-time actor. You're writing movies. You have your own production company. So anybody that says, I don't have time for that, I'm going to say, check out my interview with Kurt Dimer. You can do it if you want. <laughs> you can have time. Yeah. I mean, you can have all the talent in the world if you don't work hard, nothing is ever going to happen i'm i mean i'm working right now i just took time to do the interview but i'm always working and doing the, the interview is not work to me but i am blessed to be able to have someone like you who appreciates the hard work i'm putting in and sharing it with the world so we can continue to get more followers so i can go actually play a show and not be hidden behind everybody else's stuff i can put on a theatrical show or I can go shoot another movie when these come out and uh, continue to entertain people till the day I die. So that's all well, I want to do. Yeah, well, you're doing yeah. well. And I have to say, um, I was take this as the ultimate compliment. I was listening to your music when I was uh, doing a run the other day and I said, who can I compare him to? I couldn't think of one person. You have such a unique voice and I love it. I know I've, I've heard other, when I was doing my research, I heard other people compare you to uh, Les Claypool and I, see what they're saying but i really don't you have your own style your own tone i mean and the music's great i highly recommend to all my yeah. viewers who are watching this right now when you're done with this go buy his ep listen to his music follow him on spotify you will not be disappointed and that that is a big compliment because some of my major influences when i was growing up was acdc mm -hmm. bon scott had a different voice but he yeah. sang the way he sang Van Halen had their own style. They toured with Black Sabbath and they blew up, but they weren't anything like Black Sabbath or the other metal bands. And to be unique, I think, is uh, very important because people uh, constantly need to be able to hear something new and fresh and not something that's maybe all the same. I mean, there's a lot of good salsas out there that are kind of average or they taste good or they're even really good. But then there's that one that's really unique. And I think it's important to differentiate yourself by being unique. I'm going to stay true to who I am. I want to do this a long time. I'm not going to force myself to sing or be somebody I'm not or sing another way because I won't be able to sustain it forever. If I stay in my lane, I can do this forever and entertain people. And if 1% of the world likes the way I'm doing it, we're in pretty good shape. So. So, yeah, you said ACDC, Bon Scott was one of your influences growing up. What other kind of bands did you grow up listening to? ACD, well, the AC uniqueness of ACDC and yeah. um, Van Halen was yeah. referring to your comment about how you can't think of anybody else like me. But I, I saw Judas Priest like nine times. I saw Ozzy and Randy Rhodes. That's impressive. I went to concerts every month. I lived in Houston from fifth grade until junior in high school. So... That was my heyday of going to concerts like two or three a month at the arenas down in Houston. So I saw Iron Maiden before Bruce was in the band. You know, so I saw you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw Billy. Yeah, Paul. I saw Billy Squire open up for Foreigner, open up for Journey, open up Loverboy, wow. all that shit. Yeah. Well, so, that, yeah and I was in all that. I, I had bad anxiety back then. I go, I'd love to do this, but there's no way in hell I can do it because I'll just get too scared. But I figured that out. So here we are. So <laughs> now I can't wait to get on stage. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you that. What prompt? Did you ever take any musical lessons at all? Any singing lessons? Any kind of at all? Or do you just a natural? Oh no, never any acting lessons. I've taken vo vocal lessons, but not until I got back into music. Now, when I was young, I didn't. I played piano first. I played drums. Um, I can dabble on the guitars, but it was, I was in the concert band in middle school as a first chair percussionist, but, uh, never, my, my sister was the big singer. She was the thespian. She could have been on the voice and all that. She died of ovarian cancer wow. back in, uh, 2013. And my dad sang in the choir. He was a baritone every week at the church and, he passed in 16, so the two of them are with me every night, and now I'm doing what they love to do. And I was just kind of the dark sheep trying to figure out why I had anxiety and couldn't function, <laughs> you know, when they were doing all that. Wow. And now it's like they, they both passed, and now their powers have been instilled in me 
to carry out what they love to do and their passion. And we all do it together now. So, yeah. Well, speaking of that, I have to say another one of my favorite videos of yours is called My Dad. It's such a heartwarming, emotional video. And the song is great. Oh, thank you. So talking about your father and has the home movies and the, your videos of your mother and everything. Uh, such a great song. Yeah, and that's my sister in there too. Yeah, so yeah. it's my mom still alive, and uh, she comes to my shows. She, she's metal mom. She does videos with me sometimes, but she's uh, she's so cool. Yeah, but yeah, uh, that's I I wrote that back in probably nineteen. Um, I late at night having some beers when I used to drink beer. I quit drinking beer. I only drink vodka and water now. But right. uh, just to give all these little tidbits, <laughs> and I lost like pounds when I quit drinking beer but uh I was just sitting there it's the only song that I put out to date or that I probably ever will put out that I wrote those lyrics in 15 minutes and never changed one lyric and that's how the song came out we've only changed the way we presented it and uh, it was just heartfelt I was feeling my dad's presence and I got you know that that uh, hook came into my head or the chorus and it described him to a T and I go, I got to get this down. And the rest is hopefully going to be history. Once more people hear it. Well, I'm going to help spread the word for you. So I love that. Thank you. Now, Thank you, you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Do you, I mean, I know you write the lyrics, but do you come up with the, the beat as well and say, you know what, I'm going to, this is how I wanted to go here to the lyrics to the song and give it to a guitar player. Yeah. Well, with Ben, we did a lot of that and then when i was writing with phil x a lot of it at the beginning he would take the lyrics and then it, we would uh put the song out with pretty much the lyrics the way they were and then the more we wrote together i would give him more ideas and then he would latch on to something then he'd get a feeling that he could contribute more, more and make some changes to the original so it's been a different process every time so far and on the new album i'll have another song coming out that uh that i wrote during a one day session during COVID with uh, another artist, uh, Jason Charles Miller, that is a really cool acoustic vibe song that uh, tells another story. I needed to get it off my brain. And uh, every everyone's a little different, but most of the time I write the lyrics on my notepad on my phone. It could take 10 minutes. It could take 20. If it takes longer than 20 for the original lyrics to come out, then it, I usually just sit on it. Yeah. But those ones that come out and they flow that easily, then I'll take that. And if I feel a voice, a vibe, I'll do a voice memo with like, I want to hear, you know, this and this, or I want to hear this band meets this band. And then who I'm writing with at the time will come up with the music along with me. So I have to say, as I mentioned in the intro, you play with some of the best in the business. And for people who don't know, and I'm sure everybody does, Phil X is... He replaced Richie Sambora and Bon Jovi. So a question for you. He's playing full-time with Bon Jovi, and he's playing full-time with you as well. Is that correct? No, Phil uh, Phil is just full-time Bon Jovi now, and oh, then okay. he's doing bigger pro projects. He did tour with me okay. the first two years and wrote with me. But now my lead guitarist is Sammy Bowler out of Detroit, okay. who uh, won the Al Demio. Ola Award for Best Young Guitarist at age 20. He's wow. over 30 now, but uh, Sammy is just a unique presence, a great individual, and we complement each other very well on stage. Phil's phenomenal as well. I just, you know, you, when Phil's coming off a Bon Jovi arena tour, then he's hooking up with us at a little club with like 300 people on a Ingve Malmsteen tour, support tour, uh, you know it can weigh on you as an artist and I just want Phil to be Phil. And I know Phil wants me to be me and for me to get to where Phil is, I need to grind it out. And I just didn't feel it was that fair to bring Phil along to have to grind it out. Like I have to, to get to the point where Phil is now. So yeah, a lot went into that decision, but Phil and I are great friends and I appreciate him and everything we've done. And we'll continue to probably write music together and who knows what the future will bring. I don't exactly. know. I love that. So question for you, how did you and Phil hook up originally? From Chris Lord Algae when uh, he said, let me do a version of have a cigar and Phil's one of his session musicians that he'll bring in. And, uh, I said, who the hell played that guitar solo on Have a Cigar? It was a one-take solo. That was Phil's wow. first take. Two months later, we shoot a mu music video. We meet. 
we become friends. A couple months later, we write back to the school together. My, he took my lyrics and turned it into that. And then we just kept writing. And then I think it was April of 2021 before I knew I was going to be doing a Jeff Tate um, duo on my Burn Together song. And then we were going to do a tour and all that. And I just called Phil. I go, I can't play all these songs, these solos that you're doing in my songs and stuff. I need you with me. And we worked it out. And we had a two year run together. So well, I have to say, and this is another ultimate compliment for you because my fiance is a huge Pink Floyd fan. So without saying a word, I showed her the video and she goes, Oh my God, this is great. And for her to say that about anybody else doing Pink Floyd is oh. the ultimate compliment because she is such a snob when it comes to Pink Floyd and for her to say, wow, this is great. I mean, she was mesmerized watching the screen. She goes, can we see it again? I said, yeah, let's watch it again. So, and I love awesome. that version of it. Yeah, like you said, the guitar solo is amazing. Your singing is great in the song. It's just everything about it. I love that whole arrangement that you did for a half a cigar. Well, that Chris Lord Algae came up with that, and uh, I can't think of any other way it should have been done. And we that's one song we played every show that we've played because people are blown away by it. And I don't want to sing it like Pink Floyd. I've got other covers I've got that'll be coming out, but I don't, I do them my way, not the way the original artist, I'm just paying homage to them and their great tune. And then I'm interpreting it the way I do it. Yeah. Which I love that because I can't understand with movies and music, if you're going to do it exactly like the original, well then I'll just go back and watch or listen to the original. And one example for movies anyway, is when Gus Van Zandt did psycho frame by frame. Well, what's the use of even doing that? And so I love the fact when a great musician like yourself takes a song, a great song and makes it different and in some ways even better than the original. And that's exactly well, what you did. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the compliment. Tell her thank you. Oh, you. I will definitely let her know. I have to say, because you mentioned his name several times and I did some research on him, Chris Lord Algae. He's a record producer for James Brown, Rolling Stones, Prince, Joe Cocker, Chaka Khan, Carly Simon, Tina Turner, Neil Diamond, Green Day, and that's just a small list. This guy is pretty yeah. How the hell did you hook up with him so early in your music career? Well, when I got that little place out in L.A. and then uh, my ma my manager at the time made a few calls and COVID had just hit and everybody kind of down. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it. We brought the hard drive to him. And next thing you know, I'm getting a remix of all my demos. And he dug what I did. And we went out to dinner. We became friends. We go to dinner every time I'm in L.A. all the time. And we go on trips together, we go see shows together, and we become more importantly friends. But uh, that's that's how we met. And he just kind of took me under his wing and gave me a chance. And uh, here I am. So. And also the fact that, I mean, you the EP came out in 2021. So it's really only been two years. You've toured with so many great people. I mean, you mentioned Yngwie Malmsteen, Jeff Tate, Skid Row, all these different bands. I have a question for you because I met Billy Sheehan several years ago and he was, t we were talking about the difference between Inve and Dave Lee Roth. And he said that, you know, Inve gets a lot of shit because people think he's this and that and his attitude. He goes, he's just a perfectionist. He wants everything perfect. He goes, Dave Lee, I said, what about Dave Lee Roth? He goes, he has his good days and his bad days. I said, was he an asshole? He had his good days and he had his bad days. So he actually defended Inve, but he sort of threw Dave Lee Roth under the bus without saying anything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's all different, man. Ingve was cool. He was fine. He he, at the end of the our tour together, he said, "If you ever need a, a replacement, I know all your tunes because he listed them all and he probably photographically memorized them all." But uh, so he was fine. I'm thankful to him. Jeff Tate taking me under his wing on the first tour we ever did. Then I went into Ingve. I did Ship Rocked right in between Ingve and Jeff Tate, and then I went out with Drowning Pool. Yep. After that, and uh, or Tesla, and then Drowning Pool, and then Tesla again, Tesla again, and then Skid Row and Buck Cherry, and then the Mushroom Head Halloween Month tour was we just finished, and after January one, we're heading back out with Tesla. Dates to come. <laughs> well, speaking of Tesla, let's mention Brian Wheat. He is with Tesla, and he's also your manager. Yes, correct. And we met, uh, we met actually, 
when we opened for them in Texas in 2022 in September. And he came out to me. I was sitting in my little chair having a smoke, but waiting for the show in Midland. And he said, hey, man, I really dig your vibe and your music. And he turned me on to his band Soul Motor, the Psy Project. And that was it. And a couple months later, you know, we became friends then. We exchanged numbers. And a couple months later, I'm just thinking I'm kind of stagnant right now. I had nothing in the future planned. I just felt like things weren't happening. And I just said, you know, I kind of want to shift this out of L.A. to somebody that actually started a band in their garage at 18 years old and figured out how to do it. Kind of like I started my oil company above my garage and blew it up into something. And it's uh, been taken off ever since. So Now, you said you toured with Jeff Tate. I have a question for you. Did you play Connecticut with him recently? Was it or did you tour with him more in the past because no we tour we tour with jeff uh fall of 2021 okay because i saw jeff tate was i live in connecticut and he was i went to this place in bridgeport called i think park city i know i saw this band called mystic bowie talking dreads and i said oh hey jeff tate's coming i wasn't sure if that was when you were playing with him have you ever played in connecticut no. as any small clubs yeah we played in hartford yeah, uh the webster downtown the webster, the webster and then there was another place in new haven and toad's place it's like a little theater. Yeah, Toad's Place. Or the Schubert or Toad's Place. Because Toad's Place no. is... Oh. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't recall the Toad's Place. Oh. Well, Toad's Place had a lot. So, I mean, people from like Meat Loaf, Bruce Springsteen, Sex Pistols. It's just been around forever, that club. It's a, an iconic club that's been around and it almost closed due to COVID, but they're still open now. So, yeah, that one, you wouldn't remember that one. Wellington, maybe? Oh, Maybe. There's, that might be a smaller, I'm not sure where that is, but so you have played Connecticut. Do you have any plan? Are you currently on tour right now? No, no, we're, uh, I'm going to be, I'm finishing the album right now that we're going to be putting out the next album. And I'm finishing a bunch of, of uh, uh, doing a lot of shoots for my character, the Grog, a lot of promo stuff for the movie yeah. Scared to Death. So I've got to get all that done. We're finishing the movie meeting with the people that are going to be putting it out in theaters and uh i'll be doing that all in november we'll be rehearsing in december and then we'll hit the road hard starting in january probably through most of the year now, who will you be touring with then uh the dates so far i know for sure we're doing our tesla dates uh, where it's just us and tesla so we'll be doing a longer show and a bigger stage show and then uh, we've got some other uh, tours that we're working on, festivals that my booking agent's working on. Then we're going to do headliner shows in between where we're going to go back to a lot of the cities we've already played two, three, or four times till maybe three, 400 cap venues and see what kind of draw we get. Yep. Well, I love the fact that for me living in Connecticut, it's so easy to get to Boston, New York, Rhode Island. So wherever you're playing in the area, I'm definitely going to check you out. I'll be, I'll be checking out your tour dates and uh. You'll see me in the front row moshing away and banging my head. Yeah, no, no, we'll hook you up, man. You just let me know you want to come to the show you're in. All right. I will definitely do that. Question for you. Then, If you didn't meet Brian Wheat until 2022, you said, who was booking your shows before that? If, did you have a, a previous manager? I didn't have a booking agent before that. Oh. And, um, and my manager before Brian Wheat was Andy Gould and Paul Gargano. Wow. So you were just and booking they, your own shows? Well, they were booking them. Paul and oh, Andy were oh. uh, with, and they were, you know, we were just getting started. If it weren't for Paul, I wouldn't have done, get, gotten to know Je Jeff Tate and did the song with Jeff Tate and went out on tour with Jeff Tate. So we've been very blessed in a way where our first tour was with Jeff Tate. Not many bands can start that way. No, and not at all. <laughs> thank you to Paul and Andy. That's the way I started. So. That, that is a huge, huge way to start. I mean, I, you know what's funny? What, what's your favorite Queensryche album? Uh, For me, it's the EP. I love the EP. Queen of the Reich, Lady Wore Black. It's just, and I know yeah. it's, it's so raw, So, but I mean, there's something about that EP. And I, I love the old, early Queensryche. Yeah, I, I love, I, I mean, it's hard for me to even zero in on one. I mean, but I know my favorite Queen's Rights song, Silent Lucidity. Yes, that's a great and song, too. My interpretation of that will be coming out, hopefully, here in the near future. So stay tuned.
Oh, wow. See, I love, I love it. So, so many uh, things coming up for you. Yeah. Yeah. We got some good shit coming out, man. Believe me, it's just, just a matter. You got to get it all, or you got to figure out what do you put out first? And then you've got to make it through these 20 to 30 people that pick pick or choose what to put on the radio then everybody wants you to sound like everybody on the radio and i'm like well i don't want to sound like everybody on the radio i just want to give me one chance with one song put it on the radio let's see what people do I know. you know that's I'm something i don't understand they people don't learn from that scratch because i know the oil business i can run circles around you in that but i think I, this this is a whole new animal so yeah, well, that's why I don't understand why these record companies or whoever says this is going to be a single don't learn doesn't learn from the past. Where you hear all these stories like oh, I don't want this to be the single. Well, no, but come on, give it a chance, and it ends up becoming like a big, huge hit. One example is uh, Twenty One Twelve by Rush. They said they almost got dropped by their label because nobody was they weren't selling any records, and they said, you know what, let's just go out in a blaze of glory. And then Twenty One Twelve came out and became a huge hit. But you hear like different songs, like the Beatles say, oh, we want this to hit. Like, no, we want, I don't think that's going to be good. And, and Paul and John are like, yeah, no, let's give it a chance. Came a huge hit. So, and another example would be for like just TV with Seinfeld. Like, eh, I don't know if it's something that's different. People want, people just don't want to hear the same thing over and over again because it gets boring after a while. So they should right. give things like that a chance. Do you find it easier for music now? I mean, maybe not for monetary reason or you know, for money wise, but with all the streaming, people have more of a chance to hear your music than just say the old days of like, all right, you can buy the cassette or the CD. Yeah. I think there's a better opportunity to have the chance because even back then you had the same kind of probably process for the radio, I'm assuming, but then you also had to have people that ran these labels that, you know, would give you whatever kind of funding you needed to go out and be able to even p create your art and put it out to the world. So I imagine it's easier now. Um, it only would make sense to me as a business person, yeah. but uh, it also has its, you know, other downfalls because anybody can just put out anything and, you know, we all like different things. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's top 100. And I mean, I, I probably couldn't even tell you, the top 100 songs but because it's just not my cup of tea but i have a chance because of all of this and the way it is now for people to hear it and accelerate my career quicker and get it on more ears but you still got to be able to market it effectively and and figure out ways to get it in people's heads yeah. so now, i've had bands on this show that said that um platforms such as Spotify want them to release maybe one song or two songs every three months because it's for an ADD nation and people will just, they want to keep people's interest. Like, okay, Kurt's coming out with another new song. Kurt's coming out another, you know, a couple months later. Oh, here's another one. Do you have, did you find the same experience or are you just going to release the full album and tour for a while? Well, we did the work hard, rock hard. And then we put out hero. Then we put out my dad. And then now we've put out, doom and before the ep we put out have a cigar so we've kind of done a little bit of both and i don't know if the next thing will be an ep i want to do a double album but uh we're just taking it day by day and making sure we've got the right songs that we want to take out of the pipeline to put out to the public that they're the best they can be so that we have the best chance and these folks that run radio just don't think oh he's just putting this blah blah no i i, I just let's play let's get this song out and i know i've got them it's just a matter of breaking through the the piercing the veil yeah now is it different um getting a song on radio than it is spotify and itunes when you give it to itunes and spotify will they just re release it in a platform and then oh, for your, you know i i own my own label and then i go to a train yeah puts it puts it out for me through all the uh, you know, all the places you stream music and you can put them on there. And on radio, you actually have to have another human being who's a gatekeeper of who gets on the radio and who doesn't decide they like your song before they'll let the world decide if they like your song. So it's kind of an inverted process. You would think that you'd want to put a song out and let the world decide if they like the song. And then you decide if you want to keep playing it. But you, you can't even get there if the person who's the gatekeeper decides they don't like the song. So it's yeah. it's kind of silly. 
<laughs> if we're if, if 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 it's a real democracy, it's a little backwards to me. Yeah, well, it's funny. I was I was talking to somebody. Well, did you ever hear of Constantine Marillis? He he's known for uh, American Idol, but then he's done so much more with a. Uh, he was in Rock of Ages, but the reason I'm bringing him up is because he played uh, the DJ Alan Freed, and who was involved in the payola scandal in the '50s. I'm not sure if you know about that, where he was uh-huh. he was accepting money to get bands on, and he made people like Buddy Holly, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, all these people famous because. But he, he unfortunately got thrown off the air for that and he died of um, he was he drank himself to death because he was so depressed. But the fact is, I think he what he was doing was normally these, some of these bands wouldn't even be big, but he was giving them the chance by putting them on the air and then they became huge hits. So I think that like, like we just talked about it's a if people, I think, are hungry for something different, they want to hear something other than the norm. And I think that there should be an outlet for bands like that instead of just like, all right, let's play, uh, yeah, let's play Light My Fire for the fifth time this hour. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or how, how many times? I mean, you know, no disrespect to anything, but, you know, even these heritage rock stations, it's like, OK, I've heard Radar Love for like 40 years. Why don't you why don't we have the non heritage hour? You know, where we may be introduced. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't know. I don't know enough to be I don't I don't know enough about I'm learning the radio game and you know, I, I have the utmost respect for it and I just all I'm asking for is a chance. And with folks like you who bring me on and people listening the more people listen, follow me, the more all the metrics go up on everything, my Apple plays are going up every week. The more we keep all doing that as uh, the Kurt Dimer family, then hopefully uh, the the people that uh, I need to impress, uh, who I respect that run the radio, will decide to give me a chance. And then hopefully they'll be glad they did. And uh, we'll all have a great time together for the rest of my life. And I'll just keep pumping out tunes for them. I love it. So you said you currently have approximately 40 songs already written. That, yeah. Uh, so are, are are they all recorded yeah. or are they just uh, you can't... recorded? I have more lyrics written, but th- those are actual songs that have been in the works. So. Do, you just, do you just get up, say it's like four o'clock in the morning, you're inspired, write something down, then go back to bed later? Just, are you always constantly thinking of, I have this pr- um, premise for a movie, I have this concept for a song? It seems like you always uh, have something going on. It can come into my head at a any different you just have to be ready when it comes in that's why the phone's so great with the notepad and it can hit you at one in the afternoon it most of them hit hit me at 10 and 11 at night between 10 and 2 you know when i'm you know relaxing and winding down and getting stuff in the brain but you just got to be ready because it could hit you in any given moment like my dad it just hit me at like 2 15 in the morning and there it was so yeah. So you have you you said you have you your own label as well for music. Yes. Yeah. And what's bald, the, man, bald man entertainment. The reason I'm asking that is because you, I mean, you you don't have the the pressure of like, all right, well, the label needs me to have this out by two months from now. You can, so if you want, you can take your time and say, I'm going to release this when I'm good and ready and when I have it just the way I want it. I mean, obviously you want to get it yeah. out there so that people can hear it, but it's not like you're on a time frame with the label saying, we got to get this out. We got to go put, you know, have you on tour by December? No, no, I, yeah, I'm, I, I, you know, I, everything I've done and built in my life, I've built on my own. Am I opposed to uh, partnering or, or becoming part of a label? No, but look, I don't need to, to uh, jump into something I don't need to jump if, into if I don't have to. But if I earn the respect of the industry and somebody came along and said, we want to do this with you, I would entertain that. I'd be stupid not to. But uh, right now I control my own destiny until somebody notices the fact that I can probably actually make them a lot of money and I'll hit my deadlines and all that. I mean, I built companies on my own and I'm unique and uh, I'm happy to do it. But you got to have somebody who believes in you before you can conquer that. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, with Chris Lord Algae, with uh, Brian Wheat, I think you've definitely earned the respect of a lot of people, you know, doing duets with uh, Jeff Tate, going on tour with Ingve, Skid Row, Drowning Pool. You've definitely earned a lot of respect already. Um, with, with We're getting there. We've only been touring two years. So we'll, I, I feel like next year is going to be pretty pivotal, especially when the movies come out. 
and then we can tie my characters and people will know more who I am and then they'll spread the word more and uh, my, I'll have more music coming out. So I feel really good about the future and I really feel like we're going uphill and at next year will be a big year for us. In 2020, you combined the two. You were playing music and you had the movie on in the background. How'd that go? It was that we did that during COVID because I really didn't know what to do when I got back into music. There, nothing was happening, and I wasn't afraid of the COVID stuff. And uh, I got a band together that wasn't afraid of the COVID stuff, and we just followed the rules. And we went out. And people needed to get out of their house, have a little entertainment. You know, I took a bath on it, but you know, I got out there and. My whole goal was the more you give it, the more you get in life. And I just went out and provided entertainment and got to cut my teeth and decide if I even wanted to be a musician that toured and was on stage because I hadn't done it since I was 20 until that tour. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did it, to cut my teeth, see if I enjoyed it, to help others, to give somebody hope in a time of negativity and to get my music out there. And Hellbilly Hollow wasn't even nearly done then, but you got to see the cut of what it was then. And uh, people get out of their house and fill up a thousand cap venue at 20 percent you know you knew you were going to take a bath on it but those 20 percent that were there had a great time and uh, that's how we all got st that's how i got it all started so yep. well it's funny you said it because during covid i was only working two days a week and i had the whole week i was getting paid for 40 hours but they had it was such, i mean weather wise it was such a beautiful summer and i they, they had outdoor concerts i almost every weekend i saw a different band play i saw more concerts during covid than i did probably in the 10 years before that it was just really? going, going every weekend there was this one place called crystal bees in sellington if you ever are in the connecticut area that'd be a great place for your band to play it's got a huge room. It's, it's, it's such a fun, it's a fun place. That would be cool. Some really yeah. Good there, yeah. But yeah, I, I saw so many different bands that summer because it was all outdoors and the weather was great. So uh, I'm glad you took advantage of that downtime, wrote and did went on tour with as many people as the, they were able to see you. Uh, did you, so you said that you were still working on Hellbilly Hollow at that time. The, you, were you still writing it? No, it was done. We oh, had was a, done. An initial cut of it. We actually, the, the evening was, I put, we played like 10 songs, my original Bald Man um, demo CD. And then we sh showed the movie where it was at after okay. that. Yeah. So yeah. just for those in attendance. So you got a movie and you got music and could get out of the house. And uh, I got to figure out if I really like being a front man in a band and kick, kick, you know, kick, what do you call it? Kick the tires. And I'm a totally different guy than I was then. When we, when I go on stage, I've morphed into what I am now and I'm probably going to morph into even more crazy shit, but uh, it's a learning process. You can't uh, get good unless you practice and you take risks and you try and you work and you continue to want to get better at your craft. And that's what I'm in the middle of. So. Yeah, well, that, that, quote and you the only way you can succeed is by failing just doing it over and over again until you get better I, I agree with you and there's so many different things that i do where it's the same thing so i've done stand-up comedy in the past i wrote a book i did motivational speaking now i do the radio show so just the more i do it the better i get that i try i'm not afraid to try different things i'm not afraid to fail doing it once or twice and then say you know what that didn't work let me try this so i know exactly what you mean and it's the only way you can get better it's just by doing it so Compare what were you like then as a front man compared to your what's the difference between then and now? Oh, then I was about 60 pounds heavier. I didn't know how to sing. Um, I had quit singing for all those years. Um, the biggest thing was what I like being on stage with in front of people presenting my music. Uh, I remember telling my grandma who died during COVID at 106, the week before she passed, we were doing a show in Vegas on that tour. And you said you were a motivational speaker. Her, my grandpa was, and she toured with him all over the country. Wow. And he did, he did motivational speaking and did cards, laminated cards and all that stuff. And I said, I'm just doing what grandpa did. I just write my lyrics. I'm very positive. Grandma, I take the high road. I teach, try to sing about positivity or make people think about shit in the world because I'm not afraid of it. I'm just doing what Grandpa did, but I do it motivationally through singing rock and roll. And so it's funny you said that you were a motivational speaker, but uh, 
that, that's how I approach it. And uh, that's how I do it. And I, I, I wouldn't do it any other way. I mean, yeah. why, w- why would I? Yeah. Well, it's funny. Cause in my 20s, I was in a metal band and I used to just have phones. Like we had a song called Mental Last Place to come out. My friend made me a straight jacket, come running out in a straight jacket. And we had another one just joking around called Death to Dino. I came out with a Dino in the news. And most people said, like, the only reason I come see your band is I want to see what you're going to do next. And I always say, like, I, if I want to hear a band just get on stage and play the music, I can just listen to the CD or stream it. I, I want to see a show. I want to be involved in the show. I want to see the energy. I want to hear the rawness. I don't yeah. need them to be perfect on stage. I like when they make mistakes. I like when they're having fun on stage. And it sounds like that's how you are, your band is on stage. Like you, yeah. you want to be good, but you're also just, you're, it, it's real. It's like you're having fun. You're getting into it, getting the crowd into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, then I, I just stood there. I had everybody who's been musicians forever telling me how to do this, how to do that, and which is rightfully so. I mean, they've been in the business. They've toured all over the world. I'm lucky they're even wanting to play on stage with a guy who hadn't sung for all those years. But I wouldn't be the singer I am today. I wouldn't be better at what I do today. I wouldn't be who I am today on stage if I didn't start there. So just like my company, my other companies, I started above my garage. They wouldn't be where they are today with the blend plant, with the distribution facility shipping all over the world if I didn't start above my garage and was unsure of myself, scared. You got to start somewhere, and that's where I started. So, now, what's your opinion on teleprompters on stage? I, when I first got, I, I was worried at first about uh, not remembering my lyrics. I'm not a fan of it. I'll, I'll never do it. Yeah. Um, but I'll admit at the beginning, I thought, I thought I even, I have one sitting on a shelf uh, that I thought I would need because I was unsure of myself. Yeah. But my teleprompter is I talk to my grandma who lived to be 106 and I just say, I, I don't even worry now in my head or anything. I just go to this let the lyrics come into my head, grandma, because she was always had my back my whole life. And ever since then, it's I have no issues whatsoever. So if you if you if you believe your song, you love your song, you wrote your song, the lyrics should come into your brain naturally. And I shouldn't need a teleprompter to remind yeah. me what to sing about something I wrote that I'm presenting to you, the fan. So, yeah. Now, the reason I asked that was because I interviewed <laughs> Brett Michaels, guitar player for the, uh, his solo band. And when I met, brought that, I didn't realize that cause he got, he took a little defense defense to it because, uh, Vince Neil does that. And he goes, Vince Neil's my friend. It's like, I'm just asking your opinion and what you thought about that. Because I, when I saw Paul McCartney, last year he's 80 years old i mean as far as i know he didn't have a teleprompter he's as much as he could he was dancing around telling all these stories still having fun with the music that he's been doing for over 40 years and i, I love that it's like he didn't he put on a great show but he didn't take it so seriously where he had to get every lyric correct or he was just worried that he was going to sound pitch perfect he just was up there having fun and that's i prefer that over like all right let me make sure i get this right and the, like you said when plus when you're oh yeah yeah so I, i'm that's why I asked that question because I I, and I, have nothing, and I have nothing against and I have nothing against anybody who wants to use it. That's their comfort zone. That's how they want to present their music. That's how they want to present their art. That's fine. I want to present my art original every night. Uh, I want to. I don't want to script what I'm going to say to the crowd. Oh yeah. I go out there and I feel the room and I say what comes into my mind. And every night it, it'll be different. And maybe one night I'll play naive one of my songs. Maybe I'll miss a word. I don't, I don't know, but the rock and roll fans know rock and roll is rock and roll. It's not rock and roll is not meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be lip synced. It's not meant to, it's just meant to be played raw and rock, you know, raucous and just rock it out. And let's all have a great time. And not judge each other and just have a blast you know so no, exactly and most of the people are you know drinking or not even if they're not drinking they're just having fun rocking to the music nobody's even paying attention if you make a mistake and if you just keep on going i found this out from my own personal experiences first i'd make a mistake and i'd bring it to the, everybody's attention then i realized like nobody's even caring about that so just if i keep on going and act like nothing happened they're never gonna know so just, i agree with that just as long yeah. as you're having fun nobody's gonna hold it against you uh, you, you um, like I mentioned earlier, I so said I love the fact that your songs tell stories. I, did you ever think of coming up with a concept album? And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about because I'm a huge fan of King Diamond. I'm not sure if you 
like him in that. Yeah. But, um, like, you know, he comes up with these whole, not really with Merciful Fate, that's more of the satanic side, but with his solo band, it's more of like a horror theme and it has a whole story. Did you ever think of doing something like that? Yeah, well, I've got a song uh, coming out called Big Toe that uh, is the prequel to Burn Together and Naive, which kind of, if you watch those two videos on YouTube, okay. once the other song comes out, it'll tie the other two together into a three-pack. So I've kind of already done that. Oh, good. But yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I, I, I could easily do that. And I've got a lot of tunes that I, that, you know, I've got, uh, I don't I've just got a lot of different things like that where I come at it from that vein where I'll take an interpretation or I'll take a theme and then I could build on it. Kind of, it's kind of like what Rush did on, on that, you know, twenty one twelve album. Really, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, you know, yeah. that's what that reminds me of. And they kind of told a tale. You know, it was a whole theatrical rock and roll tale. You know, it's really cool. So, no, I love that. Yeah. Plus, what made me think of that for you is because you have such a great imagination coming up with movies and you write great songs. So put the two together. That's a perfect, perfect way to uh, blend stories, music, you know, a whole, a whole, well, whole universe. No, that's, that, that's very, that's a great idea. Yeah. And I, I can't wait for you to see the big, the big toe video because then you go, OK, these three, because we're just going to put all three out then together. But Big Toe will start it. He'll be okay. That ties the now. These other two make sense to me. So. When this interview is over, that's the first thing I'm going to be checking out those videos. So yeah, burn together and naive, and then Big Toe will be probably coming out next year. We've already shot the video for it. I cannot wait. Cannot wait. Well, Kurt, it's been great having you on the show. Is there anything you want to go over that I did miss? No, I mean, we pretty much covered everything. Uh, just make sure everybody knows how to follow me. It's Kurt, K-U-R-T, Dimer, D-E-I-M-E-R. You can Google my name and a lot will come up. Um, Spotify, Apple, follow us everywhere. All at Kurt Dimer. Instagram, follow us there. Join the fam club on Facebook. And then if, most importantly, sign up at Kurt Dimer, D-E-I-M-E-R.com. Check, check me out on IMDb for the movies and everything. Well, I am proud to be part of the Kurt Dimer family. I really do appreciate you being on the show. And when uh, you have something new coming out, please come back to the Claws Corner. I'd love to have you on again. I, I will. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Shauna know uh, how much, uh, you know, I appreciated you and your thorough research. And it'd be in my honor and pleasure to be on with you anytime. And thank you for believing in me and help, help me break through the radio. Oh, you are very welcome. All right. Tell all my subscribers and watchers right now, please, as soon as you're done with this interview, follow him on Spotify, buy everything that he has, watch all his movies, support him. The guy's great. He's got, he's got plenty of great things coming up, too. You don't want to miss that. And we've only just begun. <laughs> as the Carpenters would say. <laughs> as the Carpenters would say, Karen, I listened to that growing up. My parents played it every day. So <laughs> You want to know what's funny about that is I just, um, there's a, do I live in Connecticut, as I mentioned, there was a documentary that's going around and I saw it in New Haven. I don't know if you ever heard of Cafe Nine. I don't know if you ever played there in New, in New Haven. No. It's a really small club where rock bands play, but they showed the documentary on their life. And it's like, I just feel so bad for the way they grew up. They were so talented, especially Karen. She's so talented, but she was always put down by her mother. Richard was always a favorite. She never felt anybody loved her. And that's what, you know, threw, threw her with became anorexic. But she, that voice. And the same thing with you. She had zero um, vocal ta uh, vocal lessons at all. For, I mean, and you said recently had some, but not really that much. For, for her, the, she started taking vocal lessons and they said, you know what? There's nothing more I can do with your voice. Just keep it the way it is. She was just a natural born talent. Who, and she was, yeah. I, the one thing I didn't realize, I was really surprised. I know she played drums. I didn't realize she was more of a jazz drummer. They showed clips of her. So, wow, she was really good. She's really good drummer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. that's another story. <laughs> yeah, man. No, they, they, they were phenomenal. Yeah. For what, what their genre was. No, exactly. And you know what's funny about that? One more thing is that they had the same conversation because she would not look up at the audience at all. She would turn her back because she was so shy. And they told her, said, you got to interact more with the audience. You got to like wave to the people in, in the in the back. And she goes, why do you have to reach out your hand so people can touch it? They're going to love it. And she couldn't understand the fact that like people would really want her to engage with the audience. And, right. And just do it. After I get that. it. Yeah. No, I couldn't have done that back then. I can only, she probably had the same kind of thing, panic disorder, anxiety. 
many of the things that we didn't even know what it was back then when we were yeah. growing up opposed to now where it's become like a pan uh, 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 not a pandemic but a major problem that everybody points out back then we were just kind of lost you know so i totally get it now are you are you to the point where you go on stage like it's nothing like you do you have oh it's not Oh, no, I figured out my brain didn't make serotonin when I was like 30 after all the psychologists and everything tried to get me to relax through therapy. And I figured out more. I did research on my own. My brain doesn't make serotonin. I got a serotonin uptake inhibitor and my whole life changed. And I started oil companies. I will public speak in front of classes. I taught classes. I'll get on the biggest stages of the world. I'll be in front of a movie with all the eyes. It doesn't bother me at all. You just got to figure out what the problem is and know your own body and live in the rhythm of your body. And I don't take medications or anything. I take, take that one half of that a day in a bare aspirin. And that's all I, I, I refuse to just put shit in my body that I don't like all these prescriptions and everything that's just killing people. It's just ridiculous. So I know. just know what's wrong, figure it out on your own. It's not that hard with today's world. Yeah, well, that's why I think a major problem too is most doctors they know people want medication, so it's, they just tell them, "Well, I'm feeling this. Take that." Without even looking into the problem, it's sort of like seeing the check engine light and putting a piece of duct tape over it. You're covering up the problem, but you're not really getting to the core of it and what's wrong with you. And so, just like take this, and it makes you, it basically just numbs you. It doesn't cure you. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Find out what's wrong with you. Now I'm curious about myself because I. Up until 17 or 18 years old, I don't know why, I was severely shy. And then when as soon as I got out of high school, something just snapped in me. Also, that's when I went into bands. I did radio, public speaking, wrote a book. Just all my creativity just flew out of me at that age. And I'm wondering, maybe for some, maybe there's something with serotonin with me or something to that, some kind of chemical imbalance that was throwing me off. And whatever it was, that is long gone. And I, the bigger the crowd, the better. Wherever I am, I... Because so I, I laugh when I read these things that some people that they have more of a fear of speaking in front of a public audience than they do of death. I said, for me, I love an audience. I love being in front oh, of a I big crowd. Yeah. And th that feeling it gives you, especially for bands when everybody's getting into it and you're just on stage looking down, it just pumps you up so much. Oh, yeah. And we're blessed every time we play because nobody's really heard us before and they hear us and they're like, you're this new refreshing rock band we've never heard. And they're all into it. We're an opener, whether it's direct or two before. What a, I get people lighting their phones up or I mosh pit. You know, it's just crazy. And it's uh makes you really feel like you're really doing something special to help other people. And if I can be a pillar of strength for people with a lot of problems they might have, that's that's what I'm there for. So well, I can say when I was listening to you running, I think I ran four miles in record time. It's just the more I listened to it, the more pumped up I got, the faster I was running. Oh, cool. Yeah, it cool. just got me going. So I will definitely be keeping an eye on when when, and where you're playing. And I'll, I'll let you know when uh, when you're around. I'll let you know when I'm going to check you out because I definitely can't wait to meet you in person and see the band live. That'll be, that'll be awesome. We'll be there. You'll see me next year for sure. We'll be doing probably a headline, a few little headliners up in the Northeast for sure. All so. right. Well, All right, brother. It's great having you on the show. That wraps up the latest episode of The Claws Corner. A huge thanks goes out to singer, songwriter, actor, producer, and entrepreneur, Kurt Dimer, for taking time out of his extremely busy schedule to be a guest on my show. Another huge thanks goes out to editor extraordinaire, John Bristol of Elmwood Productions, for his superb job editing my show each and every week and making it available to all on YouTube. I am also extremely grateful to Rob Bull and Joseph Timothy Quirk for all they do to make my show available on several Connecticut radio stations, as well as Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeartRadio. Thank you both very much. And lastly, but definitely not least, I need to thank you, the viewer, for always tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. Thank you.